Hi, uh, my name is Angus Mack and I'm the Chief Enterprise Architect at Doutius. Uh, we're a Microsoft Gold Partner and uh, we have, deliver consultancy and services related to data uh, and data science, as well as having an EPM practice, power platform and a managed services division. Uh, I've been in industry about 20 years and prior to Altius I was working at Microsoft in their customer success division and where I was responsible for unlocking Azure in public sector accounts for the likes of the Home Office, um, the Ministry of Justice, uh, Metropolitan Police and Ministry of Defence. I've always had an interest in data really, um, you know, how we can make sense of it and whether that's by analysing a video stream, uh, looking for objects, uh, logos, doing optical character recognition or understanding a situation, a scene analysis, um, or it might be processing large unstructured text documents using natural language processing to derive meaning or sentiment or, or derive taxonomies as well. Um, I've made a shift gradually from developer to architect over the last 20 years and I now get to use all of that combined knowledge uh, in order to deliver useful and operational data platforms to our clients. Right, so let's get started with the presentation. So the title of my uh, presentation today is The Modern Data Platform, Automate Everything. And in this talk, I want to give you an overview of um, the types of tools and processes that uh, recommend to adopt in order to ensure that you have a consistent and repeatable approach to delivering data platform architectures and also you end up with something that's uh, supportable and maintainable as well and can scale into the types of organizations that adopt these types of architectures. Um, so, as by way of an agenda today, I'm going to cover um, essentially what is a data platform uh, to set the scene uh, and to uh, describe what I consider to be uh, the architecture for an operational data lake. Um, I'm then going to talk about uh, requirements and how important they are in defining and shaping the architecture and the supporting services around the data lake. Uh, in order to deliver that uh, level of automation and consistency. I'm going to talk about uh, infrastructure as uh, a code, uh, particularly around Terraform and why we use Terraform and how important it is to have the services that you deploy into your cloud architecture defined um, in an asset that can be version controlled. And then going to talk about the vehicle for that, which we use uh, um, uh, Azure DevOps um, and we use all aspects of that and I'll go into um, how we use DevOps in order to uh, deliver uh, and then I'll talk about data pipelines and how we're able to bring automation into uh, the ingestion of data and then going to move on to um, how we monitor what we've delivered so um, automation in monitoring, logging and alerting uh, and then I'm going to cover a bit on Power BI. So how can we then uh, visualize the types of insights um, that we have delivered? So what is a data platform? So my boss, C uh, CTO of Altius, Simon Turner, describes it as a highly scalable cloud-based architecture that combines big data, relational and real-time architectures to provide a unified data platform. And essentially what that means is that uh, the data lake, you know, it's not a swamp, it's not a dumping ground. It needs to be a logical, organized, uh, controlled area where you can land multiple different types of data and then allow different business units to uh, get access to that data and make their own queries and gain, gain their own insights and understanding from those data sets. So essentially, uh, what we've had over the last 20 years is a a changing, maturing ground for, for data within uh, within this space. So if we think back to the year 2000, the millennium, 20 years ago now, uh, and data warehouse was king. Uh, typically, you know, you would ingest data into a data warehouse, uh, you'd transform that data, and then put out a fixed schema, which would load into end systems. There was a huge amount of investment in stored procedures and code. And those stored procedures and code were locked away inside that relational data store, whether it was SQL Server or whether it was Oracle. Um, and you know what you found was there's a huge amount of uh, code 
uh, rewriting. You know, someone would write a store procedure, they'd leave the company, and then someone else would come along and have to write the same thing, and they'd end up rewriting it, but calling it underscore version one or underscore new or underscore Bob or whatever it was. Uh, you know, a huge amount of du duplication and everything uh, locked away in in a closed environment, which is not, uh, not very accessible at all. If we move forward 10 years, um, essentially what's happened, you know, we big data is not a new thing. And, and as, as a term, it really encapsulates that, uh, you know, the increased data volumes uh, were basically uh, led by increase in storage capacity. So as the cost of storage went down, the amount of data that people decided they, they could keep went up, obviously. Um, but then, you know, we then needed new uh, ways of dealing uh, with that data. So things like, um, you know, MapReduce and HDFS and other technologies were developed in order to accommodate those increased uh, data volumes on, on storage. But essentially, you know, we, we just had a similar sort of approach, but just bigger volumes of data. Um, and we started to see more variety of data come in for sure. Um, but then we move forward to now and what we've got is, uh, you know, a modern, modern data platform. Uh, it's an evolved architecture and really that evolution is then increased in a, n a number and variety of different types of sources that we have. Uh, we've got real time data coming from IoT devices, from mobile devices, we've got semi structured and structured data uh, coming from you know, other streams, other, you know, APIs, uh, streaming data services. And then we've still got all of our standard structured data, you know, uh, uh, databases, relational stores as well. And those all need to be catered for. And essentially what we need to deliver is an architecture that can accommodate that. So underpinning everything that you do, uh, it's important to have, uh, key values in order to make sure that your data lake doesn't become a data swamp. You know, I think people are put off a little bit by the data lake saying, oh, it's just a dumping ground. Well, it can be. And the reasons why it won't be is that you have clear values and uh, processes in place to ensure that you have the necessary control and structure around um, how you use that storage. Uh, so the first one is governance. So someone needs to take ownership of the of the data estate, how it's used, um, you know, managed onboarding of new data sources, and also define those policies. So rather than it being a free for all in the dumping ground, um, with with you know uh, with a lack of governance, with strong governance, you can ensure that the necessary policies are in place to ensure that the data that you onboard onto your data lake is of use and is of value. And then that leads on nicely to stewardship. So typically the data sets that you would load onto the data lake are um, business unit aligned. And in order for success in your, in your data platform architecture, you need to make sure that those um, uh, business owners um, have uh, ownership of those data as assets and that those data sets are then oriented towards the, um, to the line of business that owns them. Um, data is nothing if it's not secure. Um, so it's important to adopt uh, a defense in depth strategy. Uh, so um, not only um, having network security, uh, but also um, you know, group membership roles, permissions um, on the data itself. And also critically now these days, uh, the importance of being able to support uh, GDPR uh, requirements and particularly the right to forget. So either choosing to land uh, only uh, non-personal information on your data lake or where you do land personal information um, to apply the necessary tokenization that might be relevant uh, for that data set to ensure that um, should someone require their data to be deleted, you can effectively and quickly delete that record from, from your data lake. Um, and another interesting thing about security is that I think the nature of uh, how we identify people has changed. 
So where typically before you would have you know, physical boundaries, uh, firewalls, switches, something that you could see a tangible wall in between your assets and the outside world. What we have now is more of an identity boundary. So me as an individual user, I want to be able to access my data from my mobile device, from my laptop, in the office, out on the move. Uh, and that really then comes down to having a strong uh, identity boundary. So um, being able to identify me as an individual and then being able to give me access to the services that I need to access and the data that I need to access wherever I happen to be. And that has been uh, facilitated particularly on Azure by Azure Active Directory and the types of um, services and uh, uh, facilities that that uh, directory service gives you in terms of determining you know, abnormal logins, restricting login by IP address, by location, by time, uh, and on all the sort of benefits you get from 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 that complete set of uh, tools. Um, and then trust. Obviously, we need to be able to trust the data that we have. And the importance of having a well-governed and stewarded and secure data lake is that you can have confidence in the numbers that you have on that lake. By only having one set of numbers, you have a single version of the truth. And those verified numbers then reduce the amount of discussions that you might have and any potential conflicts that you might have between different uh, departments, because there is only one number and that number is the, is, is the single version of that number, which can be shared across multiple business units and with uh, other consumers of that data. Um, and then underpinning all of that uh, is uh, data lineage. It's important crucially important to understand where your data has come from, that single version of truth. So where did those verified numbers come from? Which data sets did they come from? When were those data sets taken? Um, having a strong master data management solution, so being able to, um, uh, again, have verified versions uh, and controlled master data, which uh, feeds into your, to your other KPIs that you might be reporting against. And then auditing. So being able to record all of the actions on the lake, so who changed what, who logged in when, um, how did data change over a period of time, and uh, having a complete record of that so that should anything uh, untowards happen, you can then go back and do a root cause analysis and determine um, what, uh, what, what action um, led to a particular e event happening. So um, we've spoken a bit about the sort of the fundamental pillars. So in terms of requirements, um, so in order to deliver uh, an effective operational data lake architecture, um, you're going to need to accommodate um, a set of standards. Uh, so we've talked about those uh, just now. So being have, having you know strong policies in place to ensure uh, security um, and auditing and alerting and um, and, and logging about uh, interactions with the data lake. And then you're going to need an architecture, so a reference architecture upon which you can deliver and deploy your, your data lake uh, solution. Um, on top of that reference architecture, then design patterns, so repeatable patterns for ingesting real-time data or social data or relational data from on-prem systems or from, uh, or from publicly available data sets. Um, and then in order to implement that, you're going to need a certain set of tools. So um, as I mentioned before, where I work, we leveraged um, Azure DevOps heavily um, uh, from, from all aspects, from boards through to pipelines and repos. Um, uh, getting your reference code out of your DevOps instance into a new project. So that's the migration aspect, the code automation that I touched upon. So being able to um, automatically generate transformations from source to target data definitions. And then documentation, it's incredibly important to be able to uh, document the solutions you have. But also, if you have a set of standard documentation around your policies and your reference architecture and your design patterns, uh, making that available to uh, your consultants in a uh, controlled and governed way as well. Um, it's also important to uh, collaborate with your peers and uh, have a level of governance. So where I work, I chair our um, technical design authority or architectural review board. So leveraging the best assets that you have, which are your people and the people with years of experience, bringing those people together. So where you have a new requirement that isn't on your reference architecture to bring the relevant people together so that they can um, discuss and uh, come up with the, 
you know, the best possible repeatable solution that is in line with the overall patterns that you have for your architecture. Um, and then sharing that information across uh, with the rest of the company. Uh, so uh, encouraging people uh, to talk about success stories that they're delivered into, the, into their customers. So where, um, where I work, we have a, a thing called a lunch and learn, where we encourage our more junior consultants to um, take their first steps into public speaking, uh, to take the result of a successful delivery, and then talk about the te technical aspects of that over a Friday lunchtime, and to give them the confidence to talk in front of their peers and potentially uh, bigger audiences ab about uh, the, uh, the solution that they delivered, uh, why, why it was successful, and answer questions um, from their peers about the, the technical aspects of that deployment. And then also um, research and innovation. Uh, as you know, the cloud landscape is changing far more quickly than we're used to, whereas you know, we were on life cycles of three, five, seven years previously. We're now on life cycles of three, six or nine months. Uh, so um, where new technologies are coming in, uh, it's important to be able to evaluate those technologies and see whether they're suitable. Um, you know, you've got a strong reference architecture. You don't necessarily want to change that straight away um, by jumping on the bandwagon of a new new product. But at the same time, you need to be able to uh, evaluate a new tool and see whether it's going to um, serve you uh, well and is suitable for the types of application that you that you need. Um, so having a strong uh, research and innovation function uh, to be able to go off and investigate those technologies, um, perform an evaluation against them, and then uh, make a decision as to whether you can then bring them into your reference architecture. So what does that um, reference architecture look like? So what you can see here is um, the, uh, a classic Lambda architecture where on the top left hand side you have uh, your batch data coming in um, and uh, being landed on some temporary storage and then being moved into uh, a data lake. Um, that data lake has various uh, layers or categories of data um, which move through from a raw state to a clean and when you start to align some schema and then conform it into um, a format that can be consumed uh, through um, query on demand to uh, access the different types and shapes of data and facts and dimensions that you need. Uh, and then on the bottom left hand side, you've got your real time data stream. So typically, um, you know, this would come from IoT devices and other other real time streaming devices and uh, that comes in through uh, and then gets processed. Typically, you'd also re record and write, serialize that data uh, to disk. So you've got a forensic record of all of those events that have happened. So they get stored on the data lake as well. Uh, but then you might also um, stream that data in in, in real time, uh, apply some queries to it, and maybe create a streaming data set that you can then consume uh, from Power BI. And once you've landed your data and you, you've got it in a state that's ready to be queried, um, then you can do um, apply some, some compute uh, to that uh, data. Uh, you might want to, as I said before, create some facts and dimensions, you know, do some classic sort of uh, uh, business intelligence reporting uh, where you would then store those, um, those, those data sets in a, a standard relational store and then use Power BI to query that. Um, you've got large scale data, multiple concurrent users. You might then want to promote that into a cube server, such as analysis services, and then point Power BI at, at analysis services to, to be able to get to the scale of report delivery that you need for your organization. And then once you've got that data, you might uh, want to apply some data science. So one of the things we do where I work is uh, we have a strong data science practice and they're always after clean, uh, clean data sets, essentially. That's what they want. They want big, large, single tables of, of clean data that they can then do their feature engineering and apply the statistical modeling uh, techniques that they, they use. Um, so the way to do this uh, would be then to expose um, a certain layer of the lake, such as the clean layer of the lake, um, uh, to uh, to them, we can do this by, um, they might want to use um, 
uh, you know, a, an, a, a VM where they set up their own Python environment to do uh, machine learning that way. They may dabble in Azure ML, or they might may use other deep learning um, libraries in order to uh, gain insight and understanding from the data that's been landed on the lake. Um, and then I've talked about Power BI already, so um, being able to visualize the data that you've got. Um, and then there are other aspects, you might want to then present data uh, to client-facing portals, or you might want to expose um, your data sets through an API, and you, you might host an API um, as an Azure function, so a serverless compute, or through through Kubernetes and um, you know an API server that way. Um, so how does this map onto the physical world? Um, so, uh, so this is then essentially a mapping of the logical components onto uh, Azure physical uh, services or SKUs that you can get from Azure. And you know, pe people when we show uh, our customers this, sometimes they you know they get a little bit sort of you know, uh, it's, it's quite sort of daunting to say you know here's ev absolutely everything, and um, you know people might get con uh, concerned that they've got to have absolutely everything, that, but that's uh, certainly not the case. Um, so really what we've got here is just a, a mapping of saying how we want to handle certain uh, functionality with, with, with particular components from Azure. I mean, more often than not, this is the shape of, uh, of, a, you know, of an initial uh, data lake engagement that we would carry out. Uh, so we've got a batch data, we'd land it on blob storage. And a question I often get asked actually is only why do we have a landing zone uh, and then also a data lake storage as well. Well, typically um, the landing zone is blob storage. Uh, it's very really cheap, expendable. And the reason uh, why we have a landing zone as well is, excuse me, um, is because we um, we put a, we put a deletion policy on, on that landing area of 30 days. So should any data there not be taken um, off and, and, and moved to the governed data lake architecture, um, it will automatically be deleted after 30 days. So that sort of is another uh, protection that we can do against uh, managing personal information. So for example, you know, there might be some personal data there that gets landed on the lake. Uh, you might not want to, sorry, on, on the landing storage, you might not want that data uh, to be stored on the lake. Um, but if it gets expired after 30 days because it's not been used from, from the landing zone, then you're, you're safe from a, from a compliance point of view and also security point of view. Um, but yeah, so coming back to this sort of example here, uh, we've got our, our landing area, then we've got our data lake. We'll use Data Factory as the orchestration tool uh, to execute a Databricks notebook. That Databricks notebook will read the data that's landed on the raw layer of the data lake, it will do some transformations, and then it will write something out to a, uh, a conform layer. And then we might have another Data Factory pipeline that, uh, that, re that reads from that conform layer and then uh, ingest some uh, facts and dimensions into an Azure SQL storage, and then we'll uh, point Power BI at that SQL uh, storage, and then be able to produce some classic business intelligence re reports uh, based on the KPIs that are relevant to the business. Um, so underpinning all of that, uh, we use Azure Active Directory Services and Key Vault. So Key Vault is another interesting one as well, actually, um, being able to store all of the keys that you need to access the storage um, that Databricks needs to uh, to interact with the various services uh, in Azure. Um, these keys will automatically be generated at deployment time, and I'll come on to how we do that with infrastructure as code in a minute. Um, and then those keys are, are stored in an encrypted format in Key Vault. So as a user, I would never see those keys. I have no reason to go and see those keys, but the services operating within the data lake architecture are able to read those through a trust that Azure has between its uh, different components. Uh, so what's called a managed identity. So one Azure service will trust another and you know, uh, the, the data factory and Azure Databricks can be given uh, a, a trust uh, to Key Vault in order to be able to read the secrets that they need in order to be able to do the job that they, they need, need to do. So that sort of covers, um, from an architecture point of view, um, a logical architecture and then the physical implementation of that. So moving on to DevOps now. So as I said before, um, we make uh, good use of Azure DevOps. I think we, we probably use all aspects of it from, from, from boards to repositories, 
uh, to build and release pipelines and also then test plans and also artifacts as well. Um, we use infrastructure as code. Uh, so that means that all of the services that we deploy into Azure, so the storage, the key vault, the data factory, the Databricks, all of those different services are described um, in code and the tool of choice we use that is for Terraform. We were using ARM templates, which is the Azure Resource Manager, that's the native format of Azure, um, up until about 18 months, 24 months ago. Um, and I don't know if, if you've ever used ARM templates, they're very long, very unwieldy, um, you know, they can run into hundreds, thousands of lines and uh, not very easy to read or maintain and only work obviously on Azure. Um, the reason why we made a switch to uh, Terraform is not only because of from an ease of use and ease of read reading point of view. Um, there's also the fact that it works on um, multiple cloud platforms. We, we are predominant, predominantly a, a Microsoft shop and do um, most of our work on Azure, but we do some work with AWS and also with GCP. Uh, so from a managed services point of view and from a resourcing point of view, uh, it's important to understand that you know we only have a single language of disc of cloud service description uh, to support and you know when looking for um, you know for new resources then uh, Terraform is a skill that we find is quite prevalent in the marketplace um, and primarily one of the biggest uh, differences between ARM and Terraform is the fact that Terraform is immutable i.e you know what what is defined in Terraform is what gets um, deployed and if any changes happen uh, to your Azure services outside of Terraform, i.e. someone goes into the portal, they change a setting um, or, you know, a service gets modified in some way, um, then the next time you run your infrastructure deployment, um, Terraform will correct that uh, and it will bring your Azure uh, real estate in line is what, with what is configured um, in your Terraform scripts. And this differs from um, ARM templates in the fact if, it, if you rerun an ARM template and someone had modified something in the portal, then the ARM plate template wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't sort of correct what had been changed. Um, the other aspect to, uh, to DevOps is having a, a library of repeatable components and uh, then having, you know, build and release pipelines. So a build pipeline for infrastructure is really just collating all of those scripts together and getting it as a as a collection of scripts that can then be uh, deployed and that deployment happens through a release pipeline in DevOps. And that release pipeline will um, configure the Terraform environment, uh, read the Terraform scripts, and then apply those Terraform scripts to your um, Terraform, uh, sorry, to your Azure landscape. Um, so here you can see an example of um, a code repository. You know, we've got some uh, Terraform uh, scripts here, we've got some modules, uh, and so we've developed a number of modules that sort of collate um, similar functions together, whether that's data lake storage or Cosmos DB or SQL DB, so a set of services are around um, around that particular function, um, and we've grouped them together, and, ter and Terraform modules is a good way of doing that. Um, we, uh, yeah, so I, I didn't mention, sorry, uh, version control. So we recommend our customers to adopt a sort of standard Git flow um, methodology to version control. So typically you'd have a master branch with releases on it. You then also have a development branch. And uh, if you want to create a new feature, so you create a feature from develop, uh, you'd implement that feature. And then through a pull request, uh, you would uh, commit that feature to develop and squash commit. So um, you'd have uh, features implemented on the timeline of your develop branch. And then um, when you're ready to do a release, uh, you create a pull request from develop onto master um, and tag that as particular release. Excuse me. Um, and then the other aspect here is, so this is an example, uh, release pipeline, where you see we've got different environments. We've got a system integration testing environment, we've got user acceptance testing, uh, staging production, and uh, DR as well. And inside those uh, uh, pipeline uh, stages are a number of tasks that uh, get Terraform set up, uh, you know, initialize a Terraform plan and apply. If you're familiar, uh, that's what happens there. So 
um, an important aspect of automation within within uh, data platform is around uh, is around you know the deployment of code that does transform. So typically, when you've got data, you want to uh, it comes in a raw state. You want to transform it into a state that's more useful to you. And uh, in our reference architecture, we use Data Factory uh, and Data Databricks to do this. So Data Factory is the orchestration tool and it either periodically or in response to an event will execute a Databricks notebook. And that notebook is responsible for then uh, transforming that uh, data in the data lake. Um, and what you'll find is that when you're working with a data lake, there's typically um, quite a lot of similar repeatable transformations that you want to carry out. So that might be um, handling an event hub payload. So I mentioned earlier about uh, storing the streamed data, um, the real-time data that's coming in uh, to the data lake. And maybe a quick word on real time. I think, you know, quite often we get asked, um, you know, can it handle real time? You know, uh, you know, what, what's your real time strategy? And, and more often than not, when we go back to the customer, and we talk to them about, you know, do you really need real time? Well, you know, more often than not, the answer is probably no. Um, usually uh, a response time of 15 to 20 minutes is probably adequate from, from data landing to it being um, consumable or visible. Uh, through a dashboard. Um, it's very rare that people need instant response to um, an event that's been captured on the data lake. Uh, so um, when I was talking about yeah, handling event hub payloads, uh, so we would typically land that event hub data and then maybe, as I said, maybe every 15, 20 minutes, we'd take that last lot of data and we would transform it. Maybe you want to create some type one or type two uh, slowly changing dimensions um, or want to compute some facts. Uh, those sort of types of transformations are, are often you know, similar and repeatable. So if you imagine that you've got your source data schema and your target data schema defined, and then you have a relationship between uh, your source and your target, then it would be possible um, using some templates to generate some code in PySpark that Databricks can execute that would transform from your source to your target. Um, so, you know, thinking about the topic of this talk is around automation. So what are the values around automation? Well, really, you're reducing the amount of time that your consultants are spend uh, writing code that um, is repeated. Uh, you're improving the amount of code that gets reused by only writing things once or not even writing them at all if it's fully automated. Uh, you're reducing the amount of human error, so the amount of hum human interaction you get with the um, with the pipelines. And so you might say, well, if the human's not involved, then how can you know that your pipeline um, is doing what it's supposed to do? Well, you through the templating engine, you can um, introduce unit tests. So as a process, the template that produces the notebook knows uh, what the source should look like. It knows what the target should look like. Um, and so then you can imagine that the pipeline or, or, or the, the transformation process can implement its own unit test to say, well, did I get at the end what I, what I started with? Are there the same number of rows? Um, has anything happened to the data in between um, source and target? And if it has, then it can uh, create an error event. So from this point of view, um, you can uh, see that uh, not only are we reducing the amount of time um, spent uh, doing repetitive tasks, but we're also reducing the amount of error um, that's introduced into those tasks. Um, and, you know, we've, we've concentrated on sort of talking about um, Databricks and PySpark notebooks, but you can imagine that the tool would also be able to produce the pipelines that execute those notebooks, um, which are just simply JSON definitions. Um, and, you know, it could also be tuned uh, for synapse when uh, that becomes generally available or other computational targets. So by having that flexible source and target definition and a templating engine, you can then uh, use that uh, set of definitions to automatically generate code and, and other assets that you can use in your data transformations in your data lake architecture. So here's a pictorial representation of that. So you might have your code automation process. There's a core library of functions uh, that uh, that do, do the sort of the parsing and other stuff that you need to do. Um, you'll have your data definitions, so the sources, the targets, and the relationship between those two. 
and then you'll have a set of templates. So you might have a master template that includes um, different partial templates uh, that do different parts of your transformation. As I said, in the first instance, you might want to output uh, Databricks and Notebooks, and you can do that, as we said, with the data definitions and the templates. Um, you then might also want to extend that to be able to output the Azure Data Factory, the ADF pipelines that execute those notebooks. And, you know, as everyone's talking about it, Synapse, as we mentioned before, um, Synapse notebooks are going to have their own Spark engine, SQL engine, uh, and uh, Data Factory as well. So you might want to um, just extend those templates to output uh, Synapse uh, format notebooks uh, and pipelines also. So the flex flexibility of that templating engine uh, would allow you to extend your automation uh, to incorporate new technologies and uh, new processes. So from a workflow point of view, what does that look like? Um, so essentially the first thing you're going to need to do uh, in any, as a data engineer in any, any uh, process is to analyze your source data and uh, determine what the schema is. So the, you can either infer that schema automatically using some of the built-in functions of, of Spark, or you can define those definitions uh, manually. Uh, the next thing you're going to want to do is then is define those output schemas and then define uh, the relationship between your source and your target, your output. Uh, so I, I, so what uh, source column uh, maps to which output column. And um, uh, once you've done that, you've got your source and target uh, definitions, you've got the relationships, uh, then you uh, have a selection of templates. So as we said before, you might have a master template that includes some different partial templates that do certain things, uh, you know, uh, transforms your data in a certain way. Um, so you assemble those, you run the tool, and then save your output. And once you've got that output saved, uh, that would go into source code control, and then you'd have um, you know, a, a versioned uh, transformation uh, that you can then use uh, repeatedly um, as uh, a data transformation in your data platform. Um, another important area of automation within data platform is around monitoring, uh, logging, and alerting. So essentially we have sort of two different types here. Um, uh, I'm gonna focus on Azure and uh, talk about uh, Azure resources, but the general concepts themselves definitely lend themselves to um, other cloud platforms such as AWS and GCP. So in the Azure world, we have a thing called log analytics, and that's the um, diagnostic settings and uh, uh, log storage uh, process for the platform as a service, the PaaS components in Azure. And uh, this is where if you enable diagnostic settings for your PaaS service, that those logs end up in log analytics. And it also has the ability to attach a storage account um, so that you can keep a forensic record of all of the uh, events that get logged into, um, into your account. And the enablement of diagnostic settings for your PaaS services uh, can be um, done as part of your deployment. So we talked about the Terraform modules before. So those modules not only would deploy the services themselves, but it would also um, configure the en enablement of, of the diagnostic settings for, for each of those services that it can be enabled for. And you, know, you can also uh, create an Azure policy um, that prevents you from deploying a service unless um, diagnostic settings are turned on. Uh, the other side of that um, logging is for code that you write. So uh, when in a data platform, we've talked about transformations that we write in PySpark. Um, so in Python, but the, uh, you have the ability to uh, log to app Application Insights. So Application Insights is Azure's uh, logging as a service, if you like. Um, it's essentially the log analytics that you as an individual or as a developer write to. Um, so the log analytics is for the PaaS services, application insights is for your code. So it might, as I say, it might be PySpark in Databricks, or it might be C Sharp in an Azure serverless function. And uh, you configure your code to log to application insights, and you choose the type of event, whether it's in a metric, or whether it's in a trace, or whether it's an exception. And then, excuse me, you attach metadata um, to that event to identify where it's come from. Uh, Application Insights also has the ability to attach a storage account um, and through a process called continuous export, Application Insights will dump um, the raw data that it receives to that storage account. Um, and again, the 
implementation of that logging process can be enforced through code reviews and by having coding standards that people adhere to. And also as part of system testing or you know, acceptance testing, uh, you'll be able to determine whether those standards had been implemented or not. Um, and then bringing that all together, we have a thing called Azure Monitor. Uh, so that basically is a unified window onto log analytics and application insights together. And that's your single consistent source for all of the logs from both your PaaS services and your own code. You can query both log analytics and application insights directly from there, um, either as a scheduled basis or, or on an ad hoc basis. And uh, that allow you to do your sort of, you know, alerting queries. So every few minutes you might want to query for a particular state and take an action if that state is met, i.e., you know, a pipeline has failed five times in the last five minutes, for example. And then if you want to do some more trending uh, type, more sort of longer term analysis, you might point Power BI or your visualization tool of choice to that storage account where those, that data is being dumped to and be able to build up some uh, charts and graphs that represent the, the historical values of your, um, of your data. So essentially what we have is we have a consistent um, platform for all of the data, all of the uh, alerting and logging and monitoring data across the whole of the platform. Um, and you know, we haven't really written any code, although I suppose you know, you're writing code anyway in terms of C-sharp or, or, or PySpark, but um, essentially it's not custom. Uh, we're using the inbuilt features of the cloud platform itself to provide that unified layer of, of logging and reporting and alerting. And um, you know, any new resources that get onboarded uh, to the platform are, are automatically can be included in that without requiring any extra sort of configuration or changes on, on your part. And from a query point of view, so um, Azure Monitor we mentioned, so the, the query language into Azure Monitor is a thing called Custo. This is a SQL-like query language that Microsoft has developed to allow you to query those events. And, uh, you know, I talked about the data factory example, but you might have other examples. And so you can start to build up a library of queries that you run um, either on a sort of, you know, a scheduled basis, quite um, uh, on a quite quick uh, time. So every few minutes or so, if you're doing an alerting type query, or if you're doing a historical trending analysis query, it's the same thing. So it's the same language. Um, and that library of queries you build up and you maintain because most customers um, that you would have um, that, you, that you are managing or, or you know that you're engaged with would have similar needs around logging monitoring and alerting and you can then reuse that um, that library of queries uh, across all of your customers and it's important you know if, as I say we're, we're talking about automation so it's important to have that there and be able to leverage that library of queries uh, to be able to apply that uh, across the board so here's a pictorial representation of that uh, process and, and sort of setup that I just described. So on the top left, um, uh, we have you know the PaaS services where we just enable diagnostics and metrics, and they go through to log analytics and a storage account. Code that we write, C Sharp, Python, PowerShell, even or Bash, um, we can uh, log to application insights and you know a, a storage account. So the same storage account. And then we have those uh, alert queries, the ones we run every few minutes or so, and then our reporting queries that we might run once a day, once a week, once a month um, uh, to do that more sort of you know, trending um, uh, analysis to gain insight into the overall sort of state and uh, quality of the, um, of the service and also the, of the data that we've got in our data platform. Another area uh, we've looked at for automation is around documentation. Um, it's an important area, right? I think, you know, fundamentally, I think as technical people, no one really likes writing documents. Uh, it's definitely one of the things that uh, probably gets uh, left to the last minute and uh, people find it not only difficult because they feel like it gets in the way of actually doing stuff and, and you know, being hands-on. Um, you know, I personally often get asked for the same sort of content um, for different customers, different clients on a quite regular basis. And having, um, you know, there, there tend to be sort of multiple versions of, you know, of high level design documents or other documents floating around people's inboxes or on their desktop uh, or on Teams or on SharePoint, you know. And content management systems are sort of great uh, to that extent, but 
um, you know, people want to tailor make tailor uh, that content uh, to their particular response or, or their particular customer. So they might not want certain sections. They might want more detail on, on another section. Um, and having it scattered around all over the place can mean that you can quite often um, information can quite often be out of date and it can definitely suffer from a lack of governance. So the idea here is to come up with a solution where you separate out your content into different sort of technical sections that might be around networking, it might be around um, sort of security, user security, roles, groups, permissions, that kind of thing, um, or disaster recovery. And then you have different owners for those different sections and they're your subject matter experts who can uh, take control and, and take ownership of those different sections and make sure that they are up to date and aligned with best practice and that best practice that we mentioned uh, before being driven by a technical design authority or an architectural review board um, where your sort of your principal consultants who have that deep understanding and that deep knowledge can can own that content and then essentially what you're going to do is make that content available to people um, uh, th well through an API and then putting a web layer on top of that API so allow people to log in authenticated through Azure Active Directory uh, they can then uh, see the different sections that, of that document that are available. Uh, they can then assemble those sections uh, by you know, clicking some checkboxes, uh, dragging and dropping different sections in different order. They can click generate and what they'll end up with was, will be a branded uh, company branded Word document that contains only the in information that, they, that they need. Um, and the advantages here are, you know, that we are taking some of the repetitive strain out of um, out of writing documents and by assigning ownership, harking back to what we talked about around governance and stewardship, not only for the data in our data lake, but also the documentation that surrounds it. And then uh, by ensuring that we have different owners and different uh, and governance of those different sections, we can ensure that information um, is valid and up to date and relevant. Uh, and it's another area where we're seeing that automation can be used to improve overall quality of uh, content delivered and reduce the amount of hum human error that's involved. So finally, I wanted to talk about uh, Power BI. So once we've got all of that data onto the data lake, it's transformed, it's in a format that we want to consume it. Obviously, you're going to have your business intelligence reporting KPIs that you want to deliver. And that's the sort of fundamental um, process of the, of the data lake itself. Um, but if we want to look at the logging data, you know, that, that we talked about, the stuff that's coming from application insights and, and from log, log analytics, uh, we essentially want to um, have a, a collection of reports that allow us to get an overall, a quick insight, overall insight into the health of our data platform and also the data on the data platform. And uh, we do that by uh, having a number of reports that are pre-built. Uh, and because they're pre-built, um, we can simply point them at the storage account because we know what, uh, sorry, the storage account where uh, Log Analytics Application Insights are storing that data. Because we know where that data is and what format it's, it's in, uh, we can then ha use, reuse the same report uh, to show that, that same insight. And what this helps with is, so it helps with our managed services uh, by giving them uh, a quick insight into system health. It helps the business owners uh, by giving them an understanding of, you know, how much confidence they can have in the numbers on the data lake by giving them an insight into the quality of the data that, that goes behind those numbers. And then as you know, your data engineers or your consultants, as they're delivering the data platform, they can keep an eye on, on the report for the data quality and they can uh, use that to help them uh, develop the pipelines that they're using to ingest data to ensure that they are you know, improving the quality of the data. And for each source that they've got, they've implemented a pipeline and a transformation that delivers the information that's, that's needed uh, for the business owners. Um, Ultimately, this is going to drive use of the data platform because increased visibility of increased confidence in the quality of the data that you've got supporting the platform is going to lead to more people using that data and get better return on investment uh, for your data lake deployment that you've done. And uh, yeah, that's driven by a general overall confidence improvement um, in that data. 
So here's some example reports that we've got. Another area that I meant to touch on actually was cost management. So this is an area which we find is particularly important. So when people start out on their cloud journey, there's maybe an assumption that cloud is cheap, um, but that's not necessarily true. I mean, you know, it's, that there's a different type of cost you know, in, associated um, that's not capital expenditure, it's operational exp expenditure. And actually, you know, the probably total cost of ownership is the same, but what cloud allows you to do is fail fast and to adapt and uh, grow your infrastructure and your platform with the varying needs of the very various business units uh, in, in your company. Um, and cost management is, is an area that Azure allows you uh, to download all of the cost information for the different uh, services that you have deployed. And when we talked about the Terraform modules, another aspect of that is tagging of resources. So it's incredibly important um, for automation as well to tag the resources that you have. So uh, tagging an owner uh, for a particular resource, a cost center uh, and, a, uh, and a workload as well. Uh, so that when it comes to reporting, you can then identify how much a particular workload for a particular cost center is costing you. And not only does this give you insight into efficiency for that particular area, but then if you need to cross charge internally, for example, so for use of the data lake, you might have multiple business units all having data on the data lake and you want to be able to cross charge internally um, to uh, recoup some of that um, expenditure or even just from an accounting and reporting point of view um, through good use of tagging and the cost management API, you can quickly identify how much a particular workload is costing and who's responsible for it and then generate reports um, uh, for that and then generate numbers that you can use to, um, to, to do that internal cross billing. Um, uh, so that shows a cost management report. And then another area, as, as I mentioned, was the data quality. So how many unit tests have passed and failed? You know, what's the overall output of the data quality checks? Um, technical reconciliation and source of target reconciliation. So data sources sending you numbers at the end of the day saying we sent you a million records. Do you have a million records? And using those numbers uh, to uh, validate the data again that you have on the data lake. And then again, that can be an automated process. And by having a report that represents that, you can quickly give an insight as the overall quality of the data that you have. That about wraps up what I wanted to say uh, around uh, the automation uh, in a modern data platform. So hopefully you've got some insight into the types of tools and processes and approaches that we use in order to uh, enable us to uh, deliver uh, data platform uh, projects and uh, also allow our managed services division to support those by um, providing a consistent way of alerting, logging and monitoring those services and how you can also give your customers confidence in the quality of the data that they have on the data platform through the use of uh, unit testing and automation in data transformations. Uh, thank you uh, once again for uh, listening to this talk. And if you've got any questions or you'd like to know more, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with me at the details here. Uh, thank you.